Star Trek franchise has seen its share of ups and downs over its illustrious 50 year history. Star Trek's many installments have endured cancellation, corporate penny pinching, writer strikes, cast departures and big budget flops and it has always managed to bounce back. We're entering a new Star Trek renaissance thanks to its recent revival on television but the road to Star Trek saturation hasn't always been so smooth. Worse than the random bad luck the franchise has suffered over the years are the self inflicted wounds unintentionally inflicted by the people charged with shepherding our favourite space based entertainment. Of course no one deliberately sets out to assassinate a character or kill your childhood but the producers of Star Trek have occasionally made choices. I'm Michael from Trek Culture and here are 10 of those decisions that are a little more than unforgivable sins against the Star Trek universe that you know we'll probably just forgive anyway. Number 10 Forcing Star Trek into Enterprise You might argue that Star Trek should have always been in the title when Enterprise just then known as Enterprise premiered on UPN in 2001. At the time creators Rick Berman and Brandon Braga explained that the name Enterprise had become so synonymous with the franchise that putting Star Trek in the title was simply redundant. They also explained that because the series preceded the existing Star Trek franchise Enterprise was better suited by this simplified title. It was his own show with its own rules and conflicts all born out of the 100 years before Kirk timeframe and then the show premiered and it was basically the old Star Trek formula with a 22nd century coat of paint. Apparently the executives at UPN mandated that all the famous Trek hallmarks like phasers and transporters continue to play a part in Enterprise and veto Berman and Braga's plans to set the first season entirely on Earth. After two low rated seasons UPN requested the Star Trek brand be slapped back onto Enterprise renaming it Star Trek Enterprise. The network believed that by retitling the failing show as well as retooling certain aspects to make it sexier, viewers would miraculously return to both Enterprise and save the sinking UPN. And despite the rebranding, Star Trek Enterprise was just as unsuccessful with audiences cancelled after another two seasons. The show has since been retroactively titled Star Trek Enterprise on Netflix and other streaming platforms where audience have rediscovered the series and given it new life but renaming Enterprise midway through its run remains a bizarre and embarrassing episode in the history of the franchise and a reminder of the poor management and lack of imagination that put Star Trek on life support in 2005. Number 9 Waiting 4 Years Between Movies Star Trek Into Darkness has its flaws and no one really likes Spock screaming Khan! or the necrotic tribble with Benedict Cumberbatch's super blood in it but wouldn't the world be a better place if Star Trek Into Darkness was a small dip in quality in an ongoing film franchise instead of the regrettable middle chapter of an accidental trilogy? After the unmitigated success of J.J. Abrams' first Kelvin timeline outing in 2009, Paramount immediately announced a sequel. A year later, the film was given a release date of June 29th, 2012, and then it was delayed again and again for one reason or another until Star Trek Into Darkness was finally released on May 17th, 2013, four years after Star Trek 2009. While Into Darkness nevertheless succeeded at the box office, the returns weren't quite as unmitigatedly successful as the first film's returns. The gap between Star Trek and Star Trek Into Darkness undeniably killed the momentum and goodwill garnered by the first film. With the Marvel Cinematic Universe making inroads in the blockbuster landscape and the rise of nostalgia bait movies, audience attention span was stretched to the limit. Star Trek was essentially squeezed out of the market in the four years between films to say nothing of the additional free it took Star Trek beyond into multiplexes. If Paramount had kept the train on the tracks and released these films every two or three years like most franchises, summer 2020 could have seen Star Trek 5 or even 6 rather than vague threats of another reboot. Car Number 8 Voyager's Frequent Trips to Earth Years before Enterprise struggled to adhere to its own premise, Star Trek Voyager was having its cake and eating it too. The crew of the USS Voyager was lost in the Delta Quadrant but the show still found ways to play with Romulans, Ferengi, Klingons and Deanna Troy. For a show about a crew desperately trying to find their way home, 
Star Trek Voyager spent an inordinate amount of time telling stories that tried to skirt the predicament so the series could still use some famous Trek elements. Rather than fleshing out a new, uncharted world of the Delta Quadrant, Voyager time and time again fell back on tried and true Trek adversaries, finding ways to run into classic Alpha Quadrant aliens, even other Starfleet vessels, despite the ship's supposed distance from them. The worst example of Voyager's muddled relationship with his own premise comes in the form of the titular ship's nearly annual trips to planet Earth in some form or another. Ronald D. Moore put it best when the show was still on air. He said, Voyager won't accept itself. It won't believe it's really in the situation in this area of the galaxy and that these are really the prospects in front of them. They just won't embrace it. They fight against it. Voyager is on the other side of the galaxy and they have already run into some alien race recreating Starfleet Academy. They've run into Ferengi. They've run into the Romulans. It doesn't feel they are that far away from home. It just doesn't feel they are in that much trouble out there. Essentially, what was the point of this entire series? It's a wasted opportunity, and that's what pisses me off. Number seven, fridging Captain Giorgio. Among several questionable decisions Star Trek Discovery made in its first season and subsequently attempted to walk back in its second, the inclusion of the former Terran Emperor, Philippa Giorgio, as an anti-hero is perhaps the most bizarre. Over the course of just a few episodes, Emperor Giorgio went from being a murderous dictator who literally dined on Saru to a wisecracking surrogate mother who's just looking out for Michael Burnham. While Captain Giorgio's death in episode 2 was a Ned Stark-esque gut punch that hung over the rest of season 1, the show's continued use of Emperor Giorgio makes it clear the producers knew what an asset they had in Michelle Yeoh. However, Emperor Giorgio's presence just really serves to underscore the fact that Captain Giorgio never should have died in the first place. The cheap shock value of knocking Giorgio off so quickly would have been worth losing to keep the character alive rather than forcing the writers to strain to transform Emperor Giorgio from space Nazi to Michael's quirky adopted mummy. Number 6. Making Lorca Evil Speaking of space Nazis, Star Trek Discovery's questionable Klingon war arc served a unique purpose, depicting how a crew of sciencing do-gooders handle the horrors of war. Much of Discovery's first season found the crew fighting to show humanity at its best, when it was reduced to a brutal war with a brutal enemy. The twist, at least until midway through season one, was that Discovery's commanding officer was willing to be just as ferocious as that enemy. In his days as captain of the USS Discovery, Gabriel Lorca ordered his officers to compromise their morale by experimenting on a helpless animal, allowed Admiral Cornwall to remain a prisoner of the Klingons in order to save his command, and allowed genetic experiments on Paul Stamets to give Discovery its vaunted tactical advantage. And then Discovery hit the mirror universe, and it turned out Lorca was not a nuanced or flawed character, he was a secret fascist who thought the Terran Empire wasn't Terran Empire enough. Oh, and he also had a creepy lust for Michael, and that's why he was so kind to her in previous episodes. After squandering Michelle Yeoh's Captain Giorgio on the unnecessary shock twist of having her killed in the pilot, Star Trek Discovery misused yet another great actor. As Sarek says in the Battle of the Binary Stars, what I cannot not abide is a waste of resources. Jason Isaacs was a resource Star Trek Discovery would have been better off not wasting. Number 5. Focusing on the Artifact the show was called Star Trek Picard for a reason. It was the first Star Trek series focused on a single individual over the ensemble of a Starship crew. And yet, Jean-Luc Picard was oddly sidelined for much of his own series inaugural season by the near-weekly diversions to the artifact, the Borg cube that tantalized in the trailers and bored in the series. Picard was seeking out Data's daughter in order to save her from the Romulans, but we, the audience, Never experienced that threat because we were constantly giving glimpses of Soji's 9 to 5 aboard the artifact. And then there's Jean Luc's visit to the artifact in The Impossible Box, one of the series' best episodes, despite the fact that the cube had been defanged by the preceding four episodes. The Impossible Box depicted Picard boarding the artifact with deep dread, but the audience was unable to feel that tension because the show spent so much time portraying the artifact as basically just a workplace. The audience knew Picard's dread was misplaced because, hell, the artifact had a bar that served Romulan ale. 
Star Trek Picard could have shared Picard's eagerness to track down Data's daughter, his fear at what terrors the cube may have had in store for him, and his catharsis when he discovered the artifact wasn't a nightmare factory, but a place of hopeful restoration. Instead, the producers inexplicably chose to interrupt the show's narrative with pointless diversions that ultimately hurt the show and Picard himself. Number 4. Killing Kirk the idea of passing the baton from Star Trek the original series to Star Trek The Next Generation wasn't a bad one. The problem was just that the task had already been done. Kirk's parting log in the undiscovered country spelt it out in no uncertain terms. This ship and her history will shortly become the care of another crew. To them and their posterity, we commit our future. They will continue the voyages we have begun and journey to all those undiscovered countries, boldly going where no man, where no one, has gone before. Star Trek Generations, underrated though it may be, commits the cardinal sin of forcing the character back into action, when his usefulness within the story is peripheral at best. The film drags Kirk from the rest of his life simply to end it with the notion of the character, the man living out the rest of his life off screen, proves more promising and ultimately more fulfilling than any screenwriter could dramatise. Kirk could have died on the bridge of the Enterprise or smushed under a bridge on Viridian 3. It doesn't matter because the character's story had ended by the time writers Ronald D. Moore and Brendan Braga decided to put him in his grave. Kirk's death in Star Trek Generations isn't bad because of the way he went out. It's bad because the writers thought the only way to resolve the character and move the franchise forward was to kill him. Number 3. Beating down Michael Burnham Michael Burnham can't catch a break. She's Starfleet's first mutineer, responsible for the murder of her surrogate mother and the war that resulted in thousands of deaths. Her parents were killed by Klingons, but she accidentally fell in love with one. She was raised by a less than loving foster father, hated by her adopted brother, peeved on by her former captain who turned out to be an evil doer from another universe, was reunited with and immediately separated from her long lost biological mum and she's also the Red Angel, designed to leave her life behind in order to save the universe from the robotic apocalypse. But what do we really know about Michael after two seasons of Star Trek Discovery? She's smart and determined and likes some science, but what does she want in life? What motivates this character? Owing to Sonequa Martin-Green's powerhouse performance, we do know that Michael is a strong, independent woman of action. But that's in spite of the fact that the writers of Star Trek Discovery seem to believe the best way to tell stories about her is by making her sob. Star Trek Discovery has replaced developing Michael's character with making her the galaxy's punching bag. The show continually mines drama from tearing Michael down, but with each scene in which Burnham is reduced to tears, the less impact this has. Thankfully, Star Trek Discovery is an ongoing series and we'll see what it has in store for Michael Burnham as she red angels herself into the 32nd century. But let's hope whatever happens to Michael and the crew in the far future, it serves to build Burnham up rather than tear her down yet again. Number 2. Character Assassinating Neelix Star Trek Voyager's Talaxian chef, morale officer and ambassador is a beloved and iconic Star Trek character. And he's also very, 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 very annoying. To his credit, Ethan Phillips puts enormous energy into his portrayal of Neelix and continues to impress in his role as Spike in HBO's Avenue 5. However, the writers of Star Trek Voyager vacillated between treating Neelix as absurd comic relief and a well-rounded individual the audience could sympathise with. Neelix continually and intentionally irritated the Starfleet crew, not in a way that showed that these Starfleet officers could loosen up and learn something from their Talaxian passenger, but in a way that made Neelix look totally obnoxious. Neelix's relationship with Tuvok was especially egregious, with Neelix frequently criticising Vulcan culture and the shows failing to show how hypocritical and intolerant Neelix's behaviour was. Star Trek Voyager didn't use Neelix, who was often the show's comic relief, to depict the irony of that cultural clash. It just had him unnecessarily getting in Tuvok's face. 
The episode The Cloud features Neelix becoming so fed up with Voyager's frequent stops that he marches into Janeway's room and demands that she let him off the ship for the duration of the mission. Naturally, Janeway shuts him down with the iconic that's a Starfleet expression for get out exchange, but this early episode showed Neelix to be the less than snuggly teddy bear he appeared to be and more just a self-centered jerk. And then of course there's Neelix's bizarre relationship with Kess, without even touching the notion that she's less than two years old and in a committed relationship with a grown man, Voyager really did no work to establish why Kess would be in love with Neelix. The episodes Phage, Elosium and Partusion depict Neelix overcome with jealousy over his perception, right or wrong, that walking hormone Tom Paris is attempting to get into Kess's jumpsuit. But Neelix's jealousy of Tom is not rooted in his love of Kess, but rather possessiveness, and Kess is rightly put off this behaviour. Neelix would chill out as the series progressed, becoming less wacky and more good-hearted, but it's a bad sign when an episode like Phage, in which Neelix loses his lungs to the Vidians, makes the audience root for the organ-harvesting mutants rather than Neelix. And number one, sticking with the Prime Universe. The biggest sin of the modern era of Star Trek is that the producers continue to be beholden to more than 50 years of continuity because setting their new shows in the Prime Universe sounds good. One of the successes of J.J. Abrams' 2009 Star Trek reboot was the clever creation of a new universe that also maintained the old canon. Utilised for only three movies, Abrams' Kelvin timeline allowed previous franchise instalments to remain canon while creating a new place to tell fresh stories. Unfortunately, diehard fans were less than thrilled with Abrams' take and a stigma was attached to the Kelvin timeline. It wasn't really mainline Star Trek, just a convoluted excuse to make popcorn movies. While Star Trek Discovery creator Brian Fuller toyed with the idea of setting his show in the Kelvin timeline, the decision was made to place it firmly in the Prime Universe and then proceed to tell two seasons of story that rather explicitly or implicitly violated the continuity of that universe. By the second season finale, the producers attempted to reconcile this discontinuity by having the characters ordered by pain of death to never discuss the very existence of the titular ship. Rather than utilising the blank canvas of the Kelvin timeline or even creating a whole new setting, the producers instead decided to perform writer's room gymnastics to make Star Trek Discovery fit the prime universe. Star Trek Discovery's third season will see the ship and crew sent to the distant future where the storytelling potential is limitless, but this could have been achieved from day one. The producers used the buzzword of the Prime Universe as a meaningless carrot to get old school fans back in the audience, sacrificing the continuity those old school fans cherished and placing themselves into something that neither Prime or Kelvin Timeline Kirk would ever accept a no-win scenario. And that's our list. Can you think of any other behind-the-scenes decisions that we as Star Trek fans can't forgive? Let us know in the comments below. I have been Michael from Trek Culture and you can follow me on Twitter at TrekLad. Stay happy, stay safe, stay well and until the next time, live long and prosper.